This is going super fast. Hello. Mr. Delora, welcome. Uh, will you please introduce yourself briefly for the tribunal? Mm -hmm. Madam Prosecutor, Mr. President, Honorable Judges, I'm Christophe Deloire. I'm both the Secretary General and Director General of Reporters Without Borders, which is a press freedom watchdog. Our clear mandate is to promote freedom, independence, and pluralism of journalism, especially by defending those who embody those ideals. My personal background uh, is the one of an investigative journalist. I also uh, authored documentary films, investigative books. I was a head of a journalism school in Paris, France, and I took office at RSF nine years ago. And we understand that you investigate now from, from your new platform the attacks on journalists from the perspective of establishing individual responsibilities as well as, as a state responsibility. Could you, in your own uh, experience, explain the role of impunity in actually furthering violations or securing the recurrence of these violations, please? Ma Madam Prosecutor, do you allow me to just make a quick general comment before I answer your question? Absolutely, please. During the break today, uh, somebody told me, oh, these are so difficult cases. Is there any hope? This is so difficult. This is so sad. Everything seems so blocked. And my answer is yes. There is a huge hope for the future that the situation improves. And the fact that we have this People's Tribunal today is the first sign of hope. If we would be des desperate, we wouldn't be there. We wouldn't be here. There wouldn't be demonstrations in the streets, as we noticed when journalists were killed in European cities. It was so impressive to see these crowds to protest. And that's a very positive sign. There is a hope when I, and really I didn't prepare this, but suddenly I wanted to say this. When I met recently with uh, the people working for Radio Chabelle in Somalia, 28 journalists of the newsroom were killed, one after one. And they hire new people, new journalists. They want to take the floor. They want to take this role. This is also part of the hope. There is a hope when we see that uh, there are new networks of journalists working on corruption, transnational networks. And uh, just a last word about your tribunal. We have prominent figures in the room today, and I spoke with Amin Mir, I don't see him anymore, but who is a famous journalist from Pakistan. <laughs> ah, oh, sorry, Hamid. And Hamid told something very important. Your tribunal does not have the capacity to put pe perpetrators behind bars but you have the capacity to name and shame. You have the capacity to launch a very important sign, a very important message to the uh, member states of the UN which do not face their own responsibilities. So I think we will be able to go out of this courtroom with also a feeling of hope. Just sorry if I, but I wanted to say this. Then I think that there's an open question uh, from from the prosecution as to what are the strategies to really, um, not to end, and nobody, you know, it's, everything will be a process, but what is from your perspective the way, the best way to address it? We entered into a decisive decade for journalism, for different reasons. But journalism itself, beyond individuals, beyond journalists, is in danger. Journalism, is fa in fact, is between the anvil and the hammer. The anvil of disinformation, of hate speech, of remorse, propelled by social networks, and the hammer of crimes against journalists. And this explains why, why 
Maria Ressa, um, previously spoke about the crimes against journalists, but also about algorithms. Because in the same time, we have algorithms, social networks, killing journalism, and perpetrators killing journalists. Due to the disintermediation, all the mighty who have something to hide or a propaganda to circulate have an increased interest in beating journalists with a hammer. That's why we see killings of journalists by unexpected people with unexpected methods or in unexpected areas. Unexpected people, who would have guessed that officials in a country like Saudi Arabia would directly order a killing of a journalist? Unexpected methods, who would have imagined what happened in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul? Unexpected areas, who would have believed that journalists, investigative journalists would have been killed in Europe after the killing of Charlie Hebdo in Paris. Between 2010 and 2020, the figures were already quoted, 990 journalists were killed because or in the course of their jobs to inform the public according to our figures. Since the beginning of this year, 36 journalists have been killed. No, sorry. 36, it was true a few days ago. But three killings occurred in the Philippines and Mexico. So now the total is 39. Let's not really discuss impunity figures. According to sources, 86%, 90%. It doesn't make a huge difference. But as long as murder is costless, impunity is a de facto rule. In Mexico, just to give this example, according to official figures, 99.6% of the investigations in the cases of assassinations and enforced disappearances of journalists fail. Journalists are victims Joel Simon, uh, who testified, said something very important. Generally speaking, the killings of journalists come at the nexus of organized crime and political uh, lack of political protection, uh, pol of political protection of, of perpetrators. Or sometimes, sometimes just lack of willingness. I will just tell you a story. Four or five years ago, I flew to Mexico to meet with the general prosecutor of Mexico and the special prosecutor on the crimes of journalists. At that time, the special prosecutor had around 100 cases on his table. I asked him a question. In how many cases did you succeed to have a sentence against the per perpetrators? He answered, in one case. I asked a second question. What was the name? He didn't remember. This guy, this special prosecutor, he, he, has been, he has left his position since then, it was a full-time job, a federal position, and a total lack of will. The domination of bureaucracy, and uh, it was really shameful. So the causes of this situation are known, failed states, lack of independence, of the ju judiciary, corruption, lack of ability, and most frequently, lack of political will, as I mentioned, to investigate and prosecute, including collusion of the authorities with organized crime. That's a question of the nexus. Uh, lack of sometimes appropriate mechanisms at the uh, international level. So John S. murders at no cost as one consequence a blank check to crimes perpetuation. So let's be clear, behind the murder of journalists, it's a society as a whole that suffers the consequence. Uh, from your experience also in something that perhaps hasn't been discussed um, today, 
Is there a lack of grassroots movement on the defense and, and denouncing the, the violence against journalists, or it is solid, um, it is there, and it, and it is present? Of course, the context plays an important role, but what we see is that, and this is possibly new, I, I spoke about the demonstrations in Europe, but also the pandemic has shown to everybody that if we lack trustworthy news and information, our right to health can be violated. So I think that there is a new perception of the importance, at least of the right to reliable information, and that journalism can play an important role. So there are a lot of organizations. We see, I spoke about Somalia, uh, we see in the countries where we travel that there are a lot of people working on it. So there is no, I, I wouldn't say that there is a lack of civil society movements. There is um, clearly a lack of implementation of the law. And let's have a look just as at um, the international law, when national, uh, the national judiciary um, doesn't, uh, is not efficient. There were so many UN resolutions adopted by various bodies, the Council of Human Rights, the UN General Assembly, the UN Security Council. How many UN resolutions? But may I play on words, simply good resolutions not efficient resolutions. The General Assembly, just the General Assembly, adopted resolutions on the protection of journalists on the issue of impunity for crimes against journalists in 2013, 2014, 2015, 2017, 2019. In 2015, the UN Security Council adopted the UN Resolution 2222, and that day, I gave an address in front of the UN Security Council and said that the implementation is key. That the problem is that there is no implementation mechanism, no concrete mechanism. This is what we need. We need um, the creation of a new position, which is a position of a special representative of the UN Secretary General for the protection of journalists, to coordinate what the UN bodies do, to have a political weight so that member states of the UN face the obligations that are given by the international law. We have now really the international law, the question is how do we implement them? And we cannot simply ask to the civil society movements to do this. Of course they can play a role in the different countries, but there are victims of the traps in those countries. They are victims of this impunity. So the best option to help them, to support them, to empower what all national, local, or international organizations can, can do is really to find a way so that the international law is really implemented. And we hope that beyond being a lesson for national judges, what you do with this tribunal will also be a lesson for the member states of the UN to take now concrete measures, including the creation of a special representative of the UN Secretary General on the protection of journalists. Thank you very much, because you answered my next question. Thank you very much about the national prosecution. Thank you. Thank you.